30 seconds remaining in the half. Austin is thrown. Touchdown! Stephen Baker. And he beats the main man, Nate Owens. And that was a perfect throw. After three or four poorly thrown balls, Jeff Hosteller hits one right where it's supposed to be. And maybe more importantly, he had time to throw the ball. And of course, folks, that was uh, courtesy of Super Bowl 25, 1991. And the man who caught that pass, which was a big catch and a big touchdown, which cut the Buffalo Bills lead 12 to 10 going into the half, of course, was the great number 85 for the New York football giants, Stephen Baker. And he joins us today on In the Spotlight. And Stephen, it's hard to believe it's been 30 years since that great Super Bowl, but uh, it's a real honor to have you on today. And I really look forward to this. Man, thank you so much. And Mike, I got to tell you, it never gets old. <laughs> Whenever I, I hear that, I still get chills because, you know, as you can imagine, that's something you work all your life for. And for us to uh, go down there under those odds and to beat the Buffalo Bills by one point, And I, I tell you, every time I hear it, it, it just brings back a flood of memories and great memories. Right. And we're going to touch on that uh, as time goes on. But I wanted to ask you before we talk about you for a second. I believe you were at a uh, giant stadium this past Sunday. Uh, your good friend, O.J. Anderson was elected to the ring of honor and stuff. So just talk about being there with some of the guys from that Super Bowl team and reminiscing. That had to be a lot of fun for you. Oh, yeah. What most people don't realize that the NFL relationships that you have on the team, we're a bunch of comedians in there, you know. And before we had the cameras and the iPhones and stuff, if we could have recorded some of the stuff that we did, man, we could have been on a Showtime at the Apollo. So when we all get together, it's like we never left. And we actually had a three-day weekend. So it was uh, Sunday, uh, I'm sorry, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. We all, we all did events and stuff. And it culminated with the, um, the Monday night game and um, a couple of guys being inducted into the Ring of Honor. And it was my honor to induct my friend or be a presenter to the great O.J. Anderson uh, because everybody always see us together. They always call me his son. We like to refer ourselves to ourselves as big brother, little brother. <laughs> but I used to watch him on TV when I was a child. And if you would have told me I would be best friends with him, I would have called you a big liar. <laughs> yeah. And we'll get to him as well because, um, sure. you know, he played a big part in that Super Bowl. But Stephen, let me ask you, because I think the journey for football, I mean, obviously you probably played as a young kid, but I, I think you attended, what was it, Alexander Hamilton High School in Los Angeles, California. And you had quite the uh, athletic career, football, track, and I, I believe gymnastics as well, correct? Yes, I was, uh, I tried to do everything and I tried to encourage kids when they're in uh, high school and junior high, try all the sports and see which one you like the best. And I did all those other sports just so I could be a better football player. Uh, ran track so I could get my speed up. Uh, gymnastics was kind of, uh, they just needed somebody to do the floor exercise. And I used to do what we call street tumbling, meaning I would see you and you call me out. I do a, a round round off, then you do a round off, do a back handspring, and then you just try to one up the guy. And uh, my coach got wind of that. And he asked me to come out for the gymnastics team and do only the floor exercise, which involved tumbling. And that's exactly how I got over my fear of going across the middle. Cause if someone took my legs out, which you can't do it today, but they took my legs out. I would always land on my feet like a cat. Uh, I did soccer too, just for fun. And I wasn't very good at handling the ball, but defense, man, I could take that ball away from you in a heartbeat. <laughs> so <laughs> I try, I tried to do everything to make myself a better football player. And let me ask you, Stephen, um, most kids, I, I believe everybody has that player. They kind of, idolizes the kids and it could be any sport not necessarily football but was there any particular athlete that you grew up really uh emulating and really like idolized as a kid well you know what I, I i i don't get me wrong i love football a lot so i, I love the <laughs> dallas cowgirls i'm sorry dallas cowboys because i was born in san antonio texas and i i love the cowboys so drew pearson was my favorite receiver but if i go back further i still i remember i had to do a book report um, in junior high for Black History Month, and it was on um, Joe Lewis, 
And that was my first like in-depth book report. I actually read the whole <laughs> Uh, paperback. And um, I learned a lot about his life story and his struggles. So I'd have to say that the great Joe Lewis um, boxer, just reading about what he endured and how he became champion, that kind of inspired me as well. Right. And let me ask you, when you were in high school, did you play on both sides of the ball? Did you play just one way? I mean, talk to me a little bit about your high school team because it was pretty successful, correct? Yeah, we, um, you know, we made it to the playoffs one year, you know, every back then the dream was just to play in a playoff game to uh, be able to play in the Coliseum in Los Angeles where USC plays. Uh, we got one game short of that and lost, but I actually played uh, safety as well. I didn't like playing safety too much because I still recall the first time I had that, you know, every defensive back, you want that dream hit of someone coming across the middle. And of course it's frowned upon today, but to like lay them out and you want them to get back up, of course. Well, that opportunity came and it was a big tight end and I ran at him with everything I had and he fell down and still held onto the ball. And it felt like I ran into a brick wall. And I remember at that point, I said, you know what? I don't ever, <laughs> ever want to do this again. And I, I still, so I would go for the pick and try to pick off balls, but my primary position was definitely offense. I'd loved running by folks and we had a quarterback, believe it or not, the year before was a center and they converted him to a quarterback. So he, had, he his throwing skills weren't 100%. Chuck Price was his name. So he would throw the ball up high, and I'd have to jump over, you know, um, defensive backs to get it. Thus, like I told you, I ran track and did gymnastics, so I had great leaping ability. But I have to attribute Chuck to some of my skills because it taught me to go up and get the ball at, the, at its highest point. Now, let me ask you, um, as far as track went, what events did you run? Were you mainly a sprinter or did you do any of the uh, long jump or triple jump or any of that stuff? Well, I was fast enough to be on both relays. Back then we called it the mile relay and the uh, four by four uh, relay. So I was always third leg on both of those. I would say I was probably the third fastest on the team. And I also did field events. That was my specialty. I did long jump, uh, triple jump, and also the high jump. I was actually city champion in the uh, long jump. So that was a feather in my cap that I'm very proud of because I, I was very good at jumping events. Yeah, and track really could help a football player a lot, especially improve their running and stuff like that. I mean, it, it really gets you ready for the season. And a lot of football players over the years would kind of do track as a way to kind of keep them in shape for football and then improve their running. Yeah, and you'd be surprised, though, Mike, these kids today, because I, I coached at Perth Amboy High School for four years football, but I did track for about 15 years. And I would try to encourage the kids that were, you know, at least the ones that were undersized, I would say, look, man, you have to run track. If you, if you're, you know, you're not, if you don't be worried about coming in first place. You want to start the season off, get a benchmark time. And by the end of the season, you beat that time you're going to be a better football player because you're a little bit faster. But these kids would fight me tooth and nail on it. Oh, coach, I'm just going to work the ladder and I'm just going to lift weights. And, you know, I try to explain to them that all that uh, strength can be overlooked if you got speed. And uh, clearly 5'8", 158 pounds, making it to the NFL. I didn't make it because I could bench press 225 10 times or even five times or even once. <laughs> <laughs> So, Stephen, talk to me a little bit about Fresno State, because you had a pretty good career there as well. I think you had over 2,000 in receiving yards in your career. So talk about playing there, uh, not maybe a powerhouse football school, but a very respectable football school for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So back then, uh, you know, I went to junior college first and um, I um, amassed a lot of numbers and that got me and afforded me the opportunity to go just about anywhere. I had offers for Purdue, UTEP. Illinois. And uh, I chose Fresno because you know when the place is right for you. And when I took the visit there, like you mentioned, they weren't a big, big powerhouse, but they did pack that stadium with 32,000 people every home game. And it was like in a bowl and they all wore red and it was known as the red wave. And I remember Coach Sweeney, God rest his soul, he told me, he said, when you come here, you're going to be able to bring all these people to their feet. <laughs> and his son was the quarterback. So, you know, we we're going to throw the ball a lot. And he was going to be there two years because uh, I transferred from junior college. I had two years of eligibility left and it was just a perfect fit. And I 
tell you, my Fresno State days were probably some of my best days as far as excitement because that red wave, and it still goes on today. The stadium's much bigger and they play in a bigger conference. But that red wave, especially on punt returns, man, let me tell you, they would all stand up because, and they would hold sirens up. This will be, probably be frowned up on today, but they would hold <laughs> sirens up because somebody was going to be going to the hospital because of the punt return uh, scheme that we had. I would catch the ball, take three steps forward to draw the defense in, and then I would give ground. I actually have footage of this. I would lose about 15, 20 yards, and the wall would be coming to me. Thus, those players would be blindsided. You know, you can't do that anymore. But they, I can still see the eyes of some of those defenders when they thought they had me dead to rights, and then all of a sudden, pow, pow. <laughs> and we ended up being third in the nation in punt return. And, I had about three call back because it's a, a fine line. But tell you, I had so much fun there with Kevin Sweeney and the guys. Uh, we, I think I only lost two games in my two-year career there. We won a championship, uh, the Cow Bowl. Not your biggest bowl in the world, but, you know, it was still – Still it was a bowl. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, ESPN coverage. And we had a lot of Thursday night games that people got to watch if they stayed up late now that I know on the East Coast because those games started at 730. But – Exciting brand of football. And college football, Stephen, I mean, especially from the, the time you played in the uh, middle 80s, I mean, it was so exciting because it was it was always popular, but it was really taken off like every Saturday. I mean, 12 o'clock, there was always a football game on. You had stuff to choose from. And college football is always very exciting. And I, what I love about college football is just the way – the whole student body gets into it. They really like embrace it. And I mean, it's just something that if any kid who's ever had that opportunity to be a fan of their school or to play for their school, it's something that you treasure forever. I'm telling you, and I still get excited. I always tell people college football is more exciting than the NFL. And if you just listen to the crowd, the crowd noise to me in a college game is more of a scream because it's more kids, you know, a pro game is more of a roar because it's mostly adults in the stadium. But that pageantry, I, I even get excited watching these games, you know, when Alabama, and Michigan yeah. and all those guys play. It's just the pageantry, man, and the tradition and the noise, man. It's like and the unpredictability, you know, you got to remember those are young kids out there playing and, um, you know, they're not paid professionals yet. And some of them, you know, I was once told, if you want to see a, a real dedicated player, watch a defensive or offensive lineman, a senior playing their last games. You're going to see somebody, because some of them, that's probably going to be the last time they play football and they're giving it their all. So I'm telling you, I'm just like you. I love college football. One thing too, Stephen, that goes a little unnoticed sometimes is, Take yourself, for instance, uh, and we're going to get to how your journey to the NFL began, but you have to have great coaching because I'm sure when you got to college, you were a good football player, a great high school football player, but you became an even better player and also a better student of the game. And that really comes down to coaching. And I think sometimes you know, college coaches, like the assistants especially, they don't always get the credit they deserve, but they really play a big part in so many of these guys' having success in the NFL. Absolutely. And and to be quite honest, the problem I see today with some kids, they don't want to listen. You know, I, I always listen to my coaches. Whenever someone told me uh, a tip or something to make me a better football player, I would do it. Um, in college, uh, Steve Mushagian, he's still coaching football to this day. He was our wide receiver coach. I love him to death to this day. He taught me everything there is to know about being a receiver. He was also a receiver at Fresno State uh, with the great Henry Ellert. And I believe he played with Stefan Page as well. Those are the two greats before, you know, Fresno State became wide receiver university. Um, but uh, even in high school, my coach, Dave Lertzman, and we mostly ran the ball. We ran the veer when I was in high school. But, right, you know, right. yeah, whenever we, 32 veer and 42 <laughs> veer, whatever. But whenever we threw the ball, you know, um, I was taught to just go get it. You know, we did drills to make me a, a better uh, football player. And and funny, my first touchdown ever in uh, organized football was in high school. It was a reverse from uh, from the wing T tight. And I just remember running 60 yards and I was like, wow, this is a good feeling. And and the rest has been um, history. But also uh, coaching my getting back to coaching Tom Coughlin. 
was probably my best wide receiver coach ever. I mean, we learned so much from Tom. He had us knowing what the receive, what the quarterbacks knew. We knew we had to learn the fronts, which was unheard of. You know, we usually looking at the defensive backs and the linebackers. He had us looking at the fronts on different um, situations on third and five. If they're in this front, there's a 90, 99 percent chance they're going to be in a cover two. This front, they're going to be cover six. And like we had to take tests the night before the game. So coaching really does play an integral part of being a, a great athlete. And these kids just have to learn to listen, man. You don't know it all. Yeah. And that, you, you're really right about that. I mean, in all aspects of sports now, I think that's a problem because oh, yeah. nowadays it, it's very hard to, to be a coach, especially in the pros as well. I mean, it's not easy. You know, when you were there years ago, it was different. You had to listen. I mean, they, they would, they cut you, but, now it's a little different and it, it's not just football it's basketball yeah. it's everywhere it's kind of yeah. changed but uh i wanted to ask you this because you just talked about it briefly explain to me this Stephen, what it's like to have to return a punt because you're waiting for that ball to come in the air you don't know who's going to be blindsiding you i mean <laughs> do you ever think about like somebody's going to come at you or you just have to keep your focus on catching that ball and trying to make a return well i like um share a quick story with you when i was at fresno the uh, I explained to you already how the, the scheme was. I actually got back there. I was second string at the time, and my good friend Julius Pitts returned a punt and did the same thing, going upfield, da-da-da, and got tackled out of bounds and sprained his ankle, and we lost yardage on it. And then they said, Baker, get in there. And I'm telling you, my knees were actually shaking because a punt return, it's like you're all back there, <laughs> way yeah. back there, all by yourself. There's nobody around. You know, you got the return, right or left, and – you got to catch the ball. So I remember when you hear the ball come off his foot, right foot of kicker, when the ball dies, it's going to die to the right, left, just the opposite. So he was a right footed kicker. And I remember looking up and I looked down to see where the coverage is. And you just have to take a mental picture and say, okay, it's either go or no go, meaning <laughs> fair catch or it's gone because you can't keep looking up and down. Yeah. Actually, there was one guy for the Steelers named Louis Lips who was very good. He would look down at the last second and look up, look up. You can YouTube it and see. He was actually pretty good at it. But it, it is, it's very nerve wracking. But I caught the ball and I took it for a touchdown the very first time I returned a punt. And of course, when I got to the pros, it's a whole different story, man. You got Parcells back there yelling at you during um, practices and hitting you with a bag and throwing water in your face and <laughs> get back there, set your feet. And it's, it's always make me feel funny because he's like, 290 pounds he probably never caught a punt in his life and he's teaching us how to catch punt returns <laughs> but the the great phil mcconkey who i um, played with i played with he was the greatest punt returner that i ever met and i'll say this not because of his breakaway ability like some of the guys uh, you know x-man for the chiefs and stuff the way he caught the ball mcconkey had the most secure catch that I've ever seen. He would go into enemy territory, like we play the Redskins. He'd put a ball under this arm, ball under this arm, one in his hand, Sean Landetta would kick. He'd throw the ball up, catch the punt, and then catch the ball that he uh, threw up. And wow. that's how, yeah, that's how solid he was. And, but he actually, we talked a lot and he actually told me that he actually, the night before a game, it, your worst fear is the game is on the line and all you have to do is secure the punt and, you know, you're back there on the 10 yard line or whatever, and it goes through your legs or your arms and then the other team recovers it. That is a punt returner's worst fear. And it's always in the back of your head, but you got to try to, um, you know, suppress it and just concentrate. And like I said, it's, it's tough though. That last look, you have to take a mental picture and say like, okay, it's either go or no go. Cause if you mess up, you're going to get tagged. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Steven, Let's talk about your NFL career. And what I've always heard when I've read about you and stuff is that there were a lot of people who told you, listen, you're you're kidding yourself if you think you're ever going to play in the NFL. There were a lot of people that kind of didn't have the belief that you could make it. And so I'm sure that was motivation right there for you to say, you know what, I'm going to prove everybody wrong. But I look at you, a guy, I think you were maybe five foot seven, and you kind of opened the door for people like Wayne Corbett and why they had successful NFL careers. But I believe you were drafted in the third round and I think mm -hmm. 80 th 83rd overall. Just talk about the journey to the NFL and how difficult it was getting there. 
Well, you know, it all started out <clears throat> as a dream and um, playing street ball in Los Angeles. We, my mother couldn't afford to put my brother and I in Pop Warner. So we played street ball where when you play street ball, there's no rules involved or weight limits. So you play, if you want to play with the 16 years old, 16 year olds and you're eight, so be it. So that's where I developed my not being afraid to play against bigger players. And of course, like you mentioned, when I got to junior high, I always share this story. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do something. I remember my history teacher, Mr. Hughesby, went around the whole classroom and asked everyone, what do they want to be when they grow up? And, you know, kids said, you know, teachers, lawyers, stuff like that. And he came to me and I said, I want to play in the NFL. And he looked at me and said, you know, and I always use the voice. He said, are you kidding me? At that time, it was only 28 teams in the league. He said, there's only 28 teams in the league. And you think you're going to be one of those guys? And the whole class kind of like laughed at me. And I, I just remember I ran home that day because I used to always time myself trying to get home. And yeah. I broke my record like crazy that day. And, um, you know, I, I always say that you shouldn't let anybody – control your destiny. If you believe it, you know, you can achieve it. Now, was it a, a large hurdle? Of course, five, eight, a hundred and what was I, 150 pounds in high school, got to junior college. I got up to 155 and then in the pros, uh, 158. But I always looked at it this way. Whenever I got on the field in a practice session, I said, I'm going to be the best receiver out here. I didn't have to boast about it and be like, okay, I'm going to, I'm the baddest, da, 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 da. And we'll get to talking about my nickname later, okay? But I didn't give myself <laughs> that nickname. A little segue. But I always tried to – I'm sorry. No, go ahead. You were okay. saying you always tried to – Yeah, I always tried to be the best whenever I was on the field. And it was kind of self-confidence. Like I could see like a guy, if he ran a quick out, I'm like, okay, he's not getting out of the break faster than me. Uh, a quick post or the deep post, he's – I could see that he didn't have the – like that. You know, see, I can still do it at 58. Um you know, I watch guys in the NFL to have that. We call it a. We used to call it a, a juke, a, a, like getting into their kitchen. It can really give it to them. Uh, some guys are good at it, and some are real lazy with it. And that was one of my strengths. I could get up on somebody, I don't, and get away from them and make separation. And so it was, uh, you know, it was a, a long journey, but I welcomed it every time I got on the field. Man, I was always trying to be the best because. Everybody always thought I was too small. and But if you can get away from people and make them look silly and open some eyes, and they can't deny you. And I I was a high jumper, like I told you. I'm only 5'8", but I can jump, shoot, higher than a six foot two guy going across the middle because I would go get it. I would go get the ball at its highest point. Some of those receivers, when they go for bombs, you know, the deep ball, they don't have the wherewithal to know how to break down and go up. You know what I mean? Because I, yeah. I used to. Uh, I was mossing people at 5'8 before Moss invented it. <laughs> and the crazy thing about your first season, Stephen, is think about this. You get drafted the the year that they win the Super Bowl. They win mm -hmm. the Super Bowl. So you're coming in to your rookie season with a lot of, uh, I would say, a lot of pressure because you're playing for a Super Bowl championship team. The other thing is I think the strike cap in that year as well. Mm -hmm. So I think um, – not everybody played right away. I know like a couple of them came back in week four. And then finally after week five, everybody came back, but it was a strike season to start the year. Well, actually I think the first two games were the main players, but then they went on strike for a few games. So, I mean, it was really a crazy introduction for your first year into the NFL. Yeah, it really was. And just, you know, Odessa Turner, my good teammate, we're still friends to this day. Uh, we didn't think we were going to make the team. And I remember Belichick coming up to us and saying, did you guys buy suits already for the last preseason game? And we're like, oh, I'm sorry. He said, did you uh, get an apartment yet? And we're like, no, because we're not sure we're going to make the team. <laughs> I remember him giving us a little wink, but we still didn't believe it until you walk through the locker room and they don't ask you for your playbook. But so we made the team. And like you mentioned, that strike, um, all, we're young. We don't know any better. We're like, we just want to play football, you know, it's just fun. But the older guys like Harry Carson and George Martin, you know, they told us, set us down as rookies and told us, look, this is um, going to benefit you guys in the long run. So don't cross the, you know, the line and, and play. And 
guys like Pepper Johnson said, yeah, remember, y'all got to come back. <laughs> We're going to be waiting for you. So we, um, you know, we took that in stride. But I recall Parcells telling us rookies um, when we made the team, uh, he huddled us up in a little thing and said, look, I won the Super Bowl with these guys. I don't need any of you SOBs. <laughs> <laughs> so you better start playing and act like you belong here or else you'll be here. You won't be here. So that was a lot of pressure. And he, he was a good coach in that sense. He always had you on edge. And it's the type of players that he wanted that could respond to his rhetoric when he's talking like that. But it was a, a frustrating year because of the strike and because all we wanted to do was play football. And, um, of course, when the strike ended, came back and um, – you know, I don't know if you're going to allude to it, but that's when I got my first NFL touchdown against yeah, the uh, yeah. yes, against the Saints, man. It was awesome. So talk about that because, Stephen, I mean, you the you you have a job to do and you're playing the game and you're in the trenches, all that, but you're still a young 22, 23-year-old kid who had this dream to play in the NFL. So let me ask you this. When you scored that first touchdown, was there a part of you that thought about that middle school teacher who told you you were crazy? if you thought you were ever playing i mean what was it like for you when you uh left when you left that stadium that night and went home i mean how did you feel well first of all the quarterback that threw it was jeff rutledge and what people what most people don't know is that when i was in high school i got an honor being an all west side receiver um in the city of los angeles and he played for the rams and he was the keynote speaker that day and he handed me my award and I shook his hand. And fast forward <laughs> against the Saints, he was the starting quarterback and he threw me my first NFL touchdown. And I remember I jumped up over the defensive back and it's almost like a bright light just happened, man. I was like, put my arms together, caught it over him. And it felt like, I was like, wow, that was big time. You know, and I ran off the field. I, of course I didn't take the ball. I was so excited. I ran off high five <laughs> everybody. I want to say Phil McConkie was probably the first one to come up and greet me, but I, um, it, it was a surreal moment. And sadly we lost that game, but I had about seven catches in that game. And the great John Madden said so many great things about me uh, during that game. And um, it, it was like, that's when I, I really felt like I'd made it. And after the game, you know, the fellas would hang out and I would say that was the first time that I was really accepted by the veterans we went out to party and stuff and we i remember we were in a club and everybody was going in separate ways and they said bake you go with lt <laughs> I'm, like, I'm going with mr taylor so i'm riding with him and his porsche to go to the uh this club that we went to and i i tell you i was I had to pinch myself i couldn't believe that i was riding with the great lawrence taylor but that was the first acceptance now to answer your question about did i uh think about that teacher I really didn't think about him until the Super Bowl when I scored the touchdown. Yeah. And yeah. When you score a touchdown in the Super Bowl, you get to address the media. And that's when I um, told them, I said, you know, this goes out to Mr. Hughesby, who said I couldn't do it. And they didn't yeah. know who I was talking about. But I sure hope he got that message because, you know, you get a whole flood of uh, emotions. Think about this, too, Stephen. When you played in the NFL, there were no restrictions. So, I mean, I think of a guy like Ronnie Lott who used to hurt people when he hit them. And I mean, it was not easy to be a wide receiver because you knew when you got that ball, there was a good chance you were going to get knocked around a little bit. So for a guy five foot seven and you said the most you weighed was 158 pounds. I mean, you you I don't care uh, how athletic you are and stuff. You have to be tough, too, because if you're not tough, you're not going to last in the NFL. The NFL mm -hmm. is a whole different game compared to to college and high school. Yeah, and I always try to explain to people because, you know, they've probably forgotten about the rules. But when you go across the middle, if that ball went off your fingertips, whoop, as long as that ball was in the air, you were live. <laughs> yeah. Meaning they could just come and, like, KO you. And um, now these kids today, they don't have to worry about that. They don't have to worry about getting what we call getting low bridged. Um, you don't have to worry about crackbacks. So I, it did take a, a lot of toughness. And actually, you know, Parcells would set up um, in a team, would set up defensive drills or defensive, um, you know, they, they script all the plays. So they'd have a play where, okay, I got to run a deep end. We're going to see how tough Baker is. You know, is he going to go for the ball? Um, 
but I never let him down because I, I knew that that was the knock against me, getting off the line of scrimmage, getting away from the press, and can he go across the middle and take a hit, and will he go for the ball? So my whole thing was when I would knew I was going to get KO, I would just make this Herculean effort for the ball. That way, you know, you're showing them you're not scared. And if I come down with it, so be it. If I don't, hey, they saw the effort, and I didn't what we call alligator arm. <laughs> <laughs> Toronto, you know, I was always like that or jumping into it. Or I made a great effort for the ball. So, yeah, it took a, a lot of guts. And, you know, I really wanted it bad, man, you know, to sh show people. And sometimes the defensive backs would be so uh, fired up, they would try to hurt me so bad that they would, you know, miss. And if I could see something coming, you're not going to hit me flush, as we say. And you mentioned the great Ronnie Lott. He caught me one time. I caught a deep route against him a uh, deep in cut which is like 16 yards and square in on uh, monday night the key to that route working is if sims throws it when i take two steps in there there's no way he can get to me but he was patting the ball and i'm taking three four and then he threw it and i'm like okay ronnie has i knew he had a beat on me if um, we had a post behind it if he didn't go to the post he's gonna be right there and anyway i caught it and as soon as i looked up i saw him right there and the kids use this term, you got to make a business decision. <laughs> Do I drop my shoulder and risk him breaking my neck on my shoulder? No, I saw him. I jumped up in the air and he caught me on the hip. I spun around, landed on my butt and popped right back up. I beat him up just to show him that he didn't hurt me. But that was the closest I've ever came to being like really knocked out. <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell you, I mean, he was one hard hitter. Let me tell you, I mean, he definitely revolutionize that position but oh no doubt so steven let's talk about 1989 a little bit because i really felt like that was one of the best giant teams never to win a super bowl just a great year by the team in general and i mean sims had a tremendous year and it was a heartbreaking loss to the rams in the playoffs but i felt like that loss left a bad taste in so many players mouths because it, it set the way for 1990 because you guys really mm -hmm. came into the 1990 season saying we're the best team yeah. And, you know, it just, you know, you can look at today's games. I, I'm just going to bring this up real quick. The Chiefs and the Bills. Look at how well the Bills are playing now because they got a taste of it. And that was similar to us when we lost to the Rams. We knew we were a good team that year. And to lose in the fashion that we did, um, we were all galvanized and, and like ready for next year. Like everybody came into training camp. Um, no holdouts. There was a lot of love in that locker room. And we knew what we had to do and i'm telling you that was probably the most the following year was probably the most fun I ever had getting those 10 wins or 11 wins in a row but uh we had no nonsense practices everybody um you know picked each other you know we laughed a lot but when it came time to practice we got down to business you know today's game i don't know if you've been to a practice lately or training camp they playing music. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when all the old timers go there, we say like, "Wow, man, that, Mr. Mayor Wellington's probably turning over in his grave because this is like, like theatrical now." And um, so. And I also feel, Stephen, that Bill Parcells would have never stood for the show Hard Knocks on his football field. He would not. He would want his practices to be private. He would not want all that stuff going on. I'm sure he would have to adapt to it a little bit because it is 2022. But I don't think he would ever be a fan of that type of stuff that happens today. And it's great for the fans, but I'm sure for the coaches and players, it could be a distraction as well. Oh, big time. Because you, you think about it, you get some kids on there that, that you know, especially today, kids with the Instagram and stuff, they want to perform for the, the camera. Um, and back in our day, Parcells, the stuff that he used to say, man, <laughs> it definitely would not make it. I mean, you know, a little curse in here, but he would say stuff that would – but be considered like the, if you had a HR department, <laughs> it'd, be, oh, it'd be lawsuits everywhere, but he did what he had to do to motivate the players. Um, yeah. It, it, but I have to say, I am a fan of it because I often was wondering like some of the things they talk about in meetings. I'm like, I can only imagine what they were saying about me. <laughs> I love how they take you on the inside, but yeah, Parcells wouldn't have stood for that. You know? Right. So, Stephen, I, I believe that 1990 season is really where you got the uh, the 
touchdown maker uh, nickname. It might have been 1989, <laughs> but I remember 1990. You were making some unbelievable catches, had some crazy touchdowns. So talk about, I mean, that's another thing, too, that, like, I'm sure you got to, like, smile and think about that teacher as well is not only did you make the NFL, not only did you catch a touchdown pass in the Super Bowl, but you have a lifetime nickname that <laughs> when people see you, they refer to you as the touchdown maker. So just talk about how that all came about. Wow, man. Good question. Um, the nickname started in junior college. Uh, the first time I ever played on artificial turf, I went to West LA junior college. We played East LA. They were the first uh, community college to get artificial turf in Los Angeles. And being a kid, being a diehard cowgirl, I mean, cowboy fan, I loved I always wanted and dreamed of playing on that surface because I said, man, it just looks so pretty and everything. And I remember that game. We went out there and I'm warming up, warming up with my teammate. And I said, dude, I feel unstoppable on this stuff. I felt I, I felt like it was cheating. And sure enough, I had four catches and I had four touchdowns off of all four catches. And he uh, reporter came up to me afterwards and said, man, that was one of the greatest junior college performances I've ever seen by a receiver. Do you mind if I write Stephen Baker, the touchdown maker? And I wasn't being cocky. I was like, all right, cool. It, it rhymes. And I went on to score 15 that year and then the following year, 16. So the nickname just stuck. And I figured I'd go to college at Fresno State. The nickname still stuck. And I'm like, okay, wait, 5'8", 158 pounds, a nickname. Maybe that'll open somebody's eyes, even if they, you know, let's just see what this guy's all about. And I averaged an astonishing and uh, 27 yards per catch when I was at Fresno State. Wow. So that opened up some eyes. And the nickname just kind of stuck, man. And, you know, some people that don't know football will give me a little flack or whatever and say, oh, you only scored 21 in six years. But if you knew giant football back in the day, all we did was run the ball. Yeah. And when they did throw it, Mark Ingram and myself, we always said, come on, man, we, you know, we probably only get three targets. It wasn't even a such thing as targets. If we get the ball thrown to us three times, we got to make something happen. And um, that 1990 season, uh, my good friend Odessa Turner – got injured probably the third game of the season. And I got my first start uh, against the uh, Redskins and I went 80 yards and uh, it was third and 17. The place went crazy yeah. and we shut them down. It was beautiful. And I went on to, you know, kept making great catches and the nickname just stuck. And it's such an honor, even um, to still to this day, when I tell people, you know, you're a giant fan, who's your, uh, you know, we, I say I'm Stephen Baker and they go to touchdown maker. I'm like, <laughs> I cannot believe 30 plus years that name still resonates. And I got a big honor out of they announced it at the stadium last night, Monday, when I was giving OJ his jacket. They, you know, Bob Papa still refers to me as the touchdown maker. So, you know, it was it was a blessing. And my whole thing behind it was it rhymed, it got me noticed, and I didn't give it to myself <laughs> like some kids yeah. do, self-proclaimed. It was um appointed to me. So I like it, though. I'm not even going to lie. It's, it's a great thing. Yeah, and, I mean, you were so excited to watch. And that 90 season, Stephen, I mean, it, it, you really felt like the Giants were going to do something special. But there was one team they had to get over the hump against, and that was the San Francisco 49ers. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting that year is you guys lost three games. You lost to the Eagles and then the following Monday to the Niners and then late in the season the Buffalo. So, you guys had to beat two teams that beat you earlier in the regular season. But, I mean, talk about the rivalry with the 49ers because for a few years they had the Giants number, and I really felt it's the same thing. I hate to say this because I'm a diehard Yankees fan, but I really felt the Red Sox had to beat the Yankees at Yankee Stadium to get over that hump. And you guys <laughs> had to go to Candlestick Park to beat the Niners to get over that hump. So talk about that a little bit. Oh, man, let me tell you, that was – you know, arguably, you know, get me wrong, the Super Bowl is a great game, but we had to go down there and beat them, and they're trying to three-peat. And yeah. it was a season of paybacks, you know. They beat us. So now we, I remember Parcells telling us after Monday night, that game when we lost, he said, guys, keep your heads up because we may see them again. And sure enough, we, we got a second chance at them. And uh, funny, we're playing the Bears this week, but when we beat the Bears – uh, I remember Parcells 
his last speech to us before we had to fly to Candlestick Park. He had uh, two suitcases in front of him. He said, look, I don't know about you guys, but I'm packing this big beep, 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 son of a gun suitcase because, you know, he wasn't planning on coming back. You know, and that's when it resonated like, you know what? He's right. We're going to go down there. We're going to win and we're going to fly right to Tampa. So there's no need to pack a small suitcase. And I remember the whole locker room. We just went crazy. And I always tell people that game was not the prettiest. But if you ever want to see a game where nobody was uh, a big part of it, we were a team. Everyone made big plays from, you know, Mark Ingram. Uh, Jeff Hostetler, yeah. um, Gary Reasons with the fake punt, uh, Mark Bavaro, myself on that last drive, getting us in field goal range, Eric Howard causing that fumble, LT recovering that fumble. It yeah. was uh, Matt Barr just kicking all field goals. It was a total team effort. And should we have won that game? No, on paper. So what I try to explain to my son, he's like, man, the Ravens going to do this to us. I was like, dude, the game is played by men. And any given Sunday, you don't know what's going on in a locker room. If everybody believes anything can happen. And I tell you what, we believed. And uh, when that play happened, when Eric Howard put his helmet on that ball and LT recovered it, man, let me tell you, you talk about like a light just comes up in your whole body like I remember Mark Ingram looking at me saying, Bay, come on, man, it's up to us. And Mark Ingram caught the, the I think uh, Bavaro caught a pass on that drive for sure. And then Mark Ingram caught one. And then I was shocked. They called my number, which is a, it's, it was called a squirrel route because they used to think of me as a little squirrel. I run so fast. <laughs> Hot fellas rolling out to my side. I'm the only receiver going out. It's a fake out, go, and then come back. And, um, I tell you, I ran that route so hard that if you ever seen the highlight, uh, John Madden says, oh, I think little Stephen Baker pushed off. But trust me, my arm was bent. I almost broke my ankle. I sprained it. I stopped so hard and the DB kept running. And I'm waiting for Hosteller to throw me the ball. And I was the last one to catch it. Out of bounds. Matt Barr came in, kicked the field goal. And I tell you, you talk about a locker room. We just hopped on the plane and went right to Tampa. It was such a surreal experience. And I also think, too, Stephen, that that helped as well is that you didn't have to have that two-week uh, layover. Mm. The Super Bowl was played the following week because it yeah. sometimes would happen in certain years where you'd have to play it the following week. And I think that was really good for you guys because you guys had this momentum. And it, I always feel like sometimes the two-week layoff, teams are flat a little bit when they come out because they've had that layoff. So I really think that helped a lot. Talk about, Stephen, though, that Super Bowl, because here's the crazy thing. I mean, you lose a quarterback who was having a phenomenal year. He's a great giant quarterback. You could even make the case, and I still believe this, that he should be in the NFL Hall of Fame. But Phil Simms was just having a phenomenal year that year. He goes down, and Jeff Hostetler steps in. And Hostetler, what I always said about him is he never made mistakes. Maybe he didn't dominate, but he didn't make mistakes, and that was the Mm -hmm. key to your success. Yeah. And, you know, what most people didn't realize is that, you know, when we do a dummy um, um, offense, meaning that we're giving the first string defense a look, we're playing, if we're playing the Redskins, Hosteller's the backup quarterback. So he'll put on whatever Mark Rippon number. And I wasn't a starter at the time. So I would put on Gary Clark's and the coaches just hold up a card of the plays that the Redskins run. And we're running against the first string defense. So Hosteller would say to me from time to time, hey, babe, come on, man. Let's get them yelled at today, meaning we're going all out, full speed on what the, what's on that card. We're not half-assed running it or brother-in-law in it or whatever. We're going like it's game time. And we would complete some passes, and Parcells would go, you know what, crazy on the first. What the hell are y'all doing? That's what's going to happen to you on Sunday. I promise you, now run it again. And then we'd beat them again. But I say that to say that. Over time, we didn't realize that we were developing our timing. And when he became a starter, we weren't worried because, hey, we've been practicing full speed all along. And that's always my message to kids that are in backup roles. You know, when you're, you know, prove the coach is wrong. If they got you playing uh, backup, you're going against that first string defense or offense, show them that they made a mistake. And um, 
So when Haas took over, we didn't lose a, a beat. If anything, he was a lot more agile than uh, Phil when the pocket broke down. You know, he could sprint out and make something happen. And then, then it becomes street ball. You know, short receivers go deep. Deep receivers come back and just get open, and he would find you. And he would give you a chance for the ball. Uh, to his credit, like um, if they caught a nine route, if the guy was even with you, he'd still throw it up because – I got faith in you. Go get it. Yeah. Unlike Sims, if you don't give him a, you know, and that that's the difference between the two. Sims, if you were even covered a little bit, he's just going to look away and dump it. But Hosteller was more of a, a rebel. He'd say, you know, go make a play for me. And, um, you know, guys responded to that. Yeah, definitely did. And the key to that Super Bowl, too, though, Stephen, I really felt was that third period or third quarter because O.J. Anderson – I mean, talk about a Super Bowl he had. He, ha You guys kept that Niners, or Niners, that Buffalo Bills offense off the field because you controlled the game. That whole third third quarter, it just looked like Buffalo never had the ball because you guys were controlling the game. And I thought that was key, too, because Buffalo, the giant defense did a tremendous job that day. But a great team like Buffalo, eventually they're going to capitalize because they're that good. So I felt like the offense being on that field for that amount of time was something that maybe doesn't always get discussed, but that was a big turning point in that Super Bowl. Uh, absolutely. And I I, I question, I, I pose this question to you. What do you think today's receivers would say the, if we if they were in a meeting the night before the Super Bowl and the offensive coordinator told them, look, at the end of this game, I want to have the longest time of possession in NFL history, meaning you're not going to get a lot of passes. Yeah, I don't. You think these new kids today would be okay with that? I, not, I think no, not. not at all. No, not at all. But you know, Mark Ingram and I were so locked in on just team and winning. He had 36 catches that year, man. I hit 34. Yeah. Don't seem like it, but we didn't care. That number didn't mean a thing. We went out there and did our job, and we knew we were going to be in that game, just grinding it out and running it, and. As you saw, whenever they threw us the ball, we had to make something happen because we never knew when we were going to get another one. And it was okay with us, with the running backs, because they always told us, Rodney, Megan, and Odess uh, OJ, bake, just get in their way. <laughs> we'll go to where we're supposed to. Just get in their way. That's all we ask. And it was, it was an honor. I mean, it was no big deal to us. We were used to running the ball, and we bought into it because – at the end of the day, it gets you one of those. <laughs> yeah, and nobody could take that away. And, Stephen, I talked about this when we, be we began the show, but your touchdown right before the half, I think there was maybe 25 seconds, something like that. That was a huge touchdown because you guys are down 12-3 to 3 at that point. Mm -hmm. You haven't gotten in the end zone. And I feel like if you guys don't score before the half there, it's going to be tough in the third quarter because Buffalo is going to have – they're not putting a lot of points up, but they're going to feel good that they only gave up three. And I really felt like that shifted the momentum back to you guys. So you may have only had two catches in that game, but you score a huge touchdown. And without that touchdown, you don't win the Super Bowl. So at the end of the day, you made a great point. People would say, oh, he only had 21 touchdowns in his career. But if you're going to look at the stats and not watch the player, then you you don't really know what you're talking about because, I mean, you always made big catches. And, I mean, that had to be very special for you to have a Super Bowl touchdown that resulted in the team winning. Man, we have no idea. And what people don't realize, the play before that, I was in the slot and Hosteller underthrew me. Uh, I had Kelsey on me with the big silly helmet on. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I beat him, and Hosteller threw, and it was like a yard short, and um, it hits the ground. And I'm like, man, that's it. That, that was my opportunity. And now it's third and five. I have no idea what they're going to – or third and 13. I'm like, I had no idea what play they were going to call. But it was a play designed for me, backside X flag. And we ran it against the um, – the, um, the Chicago Bears, I scored, and earlier in the year against the Cardinals. And I said, oh, my God, they called my number. All I got to do is beat Nate here, and I got a touchdown. So our people always ask, what were you thinking? I was thinking right here, right now, I'm going to run the best post-corner route I've ever run in my life right now. You know, I've run it a thousand times probably throughout my whole life, but this was going to be the best one. And I did everything technically sound 
meaning I attacked the DB, hit him outside, went to the post, which guys don't do anymore, put their hands out like that so the quarterback can pump it and the DB bite, came out the break, and I said, if the ball's in the air, I'm, it's a touchdown. But if, if I see it leave his hand, it's not good because <laughs> he can make up. But the ball was already in the air, and I just went to it like a magnet. And I didn't try to be perfect. I didn't think about where my, I, said, I probably got to attribute this to my golf game because I, I think too much in golf. I didn't even think. I just went to the ball. I didn't try to do hand, I just caught it like I just catch the damn ball. I caught it, dragged my feet, and I was like, wow. And not to diminish the moment, I thought the heavens were going to open up <laughs> every day. But it was just a, a regular touchdown, and it didn't really sink in until the game was over that, wow, man, you lived your dream. You scored a touchdown in the NFL. And it, it was a, a a surreal moment. You know, you work all your life for that one moment. And I always tell people, how are you going to react when it's your chance for that moment? And um, I'm happy to say that I, I came through for my team. Now, let me ask you, did you ever see that teacher again or ever go back to that school and show him the ring or anything? Or did you just say, you know what, I proved it to myself. I don't need to prove it. Yes. To Sadly, I um, I met one of his good friends who was also a coach at Hamilton. And I asked, and this was probably about five years ago. I said, Mr. Haney, is uh, Mr. Hughesby still alive? He said, yeah, we talk all the time. I said, could you please give him this message? <laughs> and I, I never heard back from him. And matter of fact, when we get off, I may hit Mr. Haney up on Facebook and ask him, uh, did he give Mr. Hughesby that message? Um, but, you know, no grudges against him. He was just, you know, you don't, that's just something you don't tell a kid growing up in the neighborhood that I grew up in that you can't do something. You know, yeah. I, I was a permanent sub for about 15 years. I coached football. I never if a kid told me they wanted to be president or an astronaut, whatever architect, I never would tell them they can't do it. Because if you have the drive and believe in yourself and want to do something, you can put yourself in position to make that happen. Yeah, absolutely. So what was your feeling like? And I mean, it's tough, too, Stephen, because you you probably are as time went on you're thinking about how scott norwood had to feel but i mean when that kick uh when he missed that kick i mean what went through your mind did it sink into you like oh my god we're super bowl champs i mean it just had to be surreal for you yeah it, it was and uh, i recall right where i was standing i'm like i don't even know what to do man do i look at it <laughs> and i lined up right where he was kicking and I was looking and I said, you know, I can't, man. My, the touchdown means nothing. We're going to we lose the game. I can't even watch it. So I turned my back and I just watched the crowd. And, you know, there's a moment of silence where 85,000 people, you could hear a pin drop <laughs> when that ball, <laughs> as soon as it was kicked. And I remember, like, uh, I looked out of the corner of my eye and I saw one of my teammates, his hips were right here by my shoulder. And I said, wow, he didn't jump that high because we lost. And I just turned around and ran on the field. I actually never saw it until I saw the highlight, how close it came. The kick went wide right. Oh, and by the way, my good friend Otis Anderson came over last year. We had a golf outing up this way where I live. And we watched the Super Bowl for the first time. Oh, wow. Entirety. Yes. And I, I ch uh, challenge all your listeners, you watch that Super Bowl or fast forward it to every kick that Norwood kicked, every one was leaking left a little. They were never straight down the center. They were always a little left. So I think he overcompensated as it got further back. And um, it, it was, it was, that's a good point to look at. I was like, wow, you know, when the pressure's on, you never know how you're going to react. Yeah, and exactly. He over, yeah, he overcompensated. And I just remember running on the field and, um, I'm an old school guy. I believe in, you know, Rocky, the first one was one of my favorite movies and yeah. still to this day because he worked so hard or whatever. And that our whole season that year to me was like a Rocky story. And I recall a reporter asking me and I was like, man, this feels just like a Rocky movie. And I went over to Thurman Thomas. Um, of course, he was looking dejected. And then I, I told him, man, you played a hell of a game. <laughs> you should, you know, be MVP. And of course, when you go home and you later you're thinking about everything and you say like, wow, Scott Norwood has to feel like, you know, he let his team down, you know, and as a human being, you feel sorry for him. And, uh, you know, but 
I always say if I was in that position, if that catch was to win the game, sorry, man, I'm not dropping that for my team because we play for each other. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, the, I don't know how these kids think today. Like, I was playing for Johnny Cooks. Um, uh, um, gosh, uh, Lawrence McGrew, who passed away, Dave Durson, all the veterans, because we knew this was their last game. I was so naive. I'm like, okay, we're going to come back again and again and again. But we played for those guys. Uh, I remember the night before they came, they all got up and spoke. And um, so we were playing for them, man. And that's what I think is what's missing with certain teams today. Play for each other, man. Know your role on the team and, and yeah. be the best player for your team. Don't worry about being the best receiver and being getting these targets and stuff. Just be the best player for your team. And I see it. I don't see that. I see it in the Buffalo Bills, man. I think they might be a pretty good team this year. They they oh, seem yeah. like they're galvanized like that. So yeah, they definitely are. And yeah, I'll tell you the other thing, Stephen. I mean, I remember New York, New York was playing when you guys won, mm -hmm. and Parcells was even enjoying the moment. You know, <laughs> he didn't smile a lot, but he was having a blast. So I mean, it was just just a wonderful like game. If you, it, if you were a player, obviously it was unforgettable, but like for a giant fan, I mean, they were just enjoying it so much. And I mean, that first Super Bowl they won, there was never a doubt. They were the best team that year. They right. were going to win that Super Bowl. But this team was such a Cinderella, Cinderella story that it was so crazy that like everything that happened. And I mean, it was just such a sight to see. Yeah, because it came out of nowhere, you know, nobody really expected us to um... – to do anything, we're underdogs going into that game with a backup quarterback, backup running back. Great Rodney Hampton got injured, so you bring in Otis Anderson with his old, dingy, dirty, smelly, stanky practice pants. I don't know if you noticed that. <laughs> if you watch the game, he had on his practice pants because he had, um, you know, Parcells was very superstitious, and when we played the um, the uh, the Bears in the championship game, I'm sorry. The, the game prior to the championship game against the yeah. 49ers, he had on those, he made a mistake and put on his practice pants. And oh they boy. Were, yeah, they dirty and dingy, but we won. And Parcel said, You wear them pants every week until we lose, uh, you know, until this run is over. I'll pay your fine. <laughs> <laughs> Parcel was very superstitious. But if you go look at that Super Bowl again, you'll see his pants weren't pretty and shiny like everybody else they were like we you know we give them a lot of crap they were dirty dingy stanky <laughs> off color but you know he was very superstitious and whatever worked and it worked for it so and Stephen, as time went on after your playing career I mean you've done a lot of speaking at different football camps a good friend of mine and he told me you're not going to remember him but you spoke at a few of the football camps he ran. Um, his name is Ronnie Leno, and he talked about pro sports experience, New York Giants camp, and there was a school in Holy Child, uh, Holy Child in uh, New York, and then there was one in Iona Prep in mm -hmm. New Rochelle, and he just said that you were one of the best speakers he ever had at those camps. He said, like, the way, like, you had everybody in tune to you and listening, and he really loved, you know, the message you were trying to send. So just talk about speaking at these different camps over the years, because I mean, it's, you had a great football career, but you've done some great things outside of football as well. No, I, I really appreciate that. Um, as you can see behind me, I'm a big kid. <laughs> so the kids all relate to me, man. I, I, you know, I guess they look at me and they see my size and, you know, I, I bring the trophy, I bring my ring, I let them hold it. Cause I want them to see, you know, make your dream come true. And I always challenge them to whatever they do in life to always give back and try to make someone else's life better. And, you know, it, it, that's always been a, a passion of mine. I had no idea that, you know, six years that I played that this is by far the most fun that I'm having is reaching others and motivating kids and even some adults to keep striving and, and, you know, go for your dream. Don't don't let anything stop you, man. If you believe in it and just when that opportunity comes, be ready. And yeah, um, yeah that's the most important thing because you never know when that opportunity is going to come, but be ready. Like I mentioned earlier, when I was a backup and going against the first string defense, I could have been out there just being lazy, going through the routes. And no, when my time come, I'm going to be ready and show them that they made a mistake. So 
I thank him for that. I really enjoy those camps. I've been doing them for about 15 years and it is the kids never change, man. I bring my, you know, drone out there, talk about technology. And I try to steer them. Like if you don't make it into any professional sports or professional entertainment, that there are other avenues that you can do. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think it's great what you do. I mean, it's a great message that you send. Steven, let me ask you, um, who are some of the teammates over the years? You've talked about OJ Anderson, obviously, but who are some of the teammates over the years that really impacted you? Just not so much like on the field, but also as a friend off the field. Well, of course, number one would be OJ, man. We like two peas in the pod, uh, but the great George Martin, you know, yeah. I just we spoke to him yesterday. He calls me his little brother as well. Uh, when I was a rookie, my locker was right next to his. And I refer to him as Mr. Martin, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, Harry Carson, Mr. Carson. Uh, those two guys are like the two matriarch, not matriarch, is it matriarch? I don't want the female. They're like the oh, two patriot, leaders. Patriot. Patriot. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they they are the epitome of what giant football is all about and being leaders on and off the field. They still do a lot for retired players. They're like our our sounding board to the um the Giants if we have any grievances or anything. Uh just two of the, the greatest guys in giant history as far as I'm concerned. And yeah. sadly, George Martin should be in the Hall of Fame somewhere, man. He is such a a, a great mentor and just like Harry Carson. Yeah, definitely were. And I mean, I, it's crazy. It took Harry so long to get oh. in because I mean, if you watched him play, he was phenomenal. So you, you tend to wonder sometimes what the writers are watching, but and thank you, man. That, that is so amazing. Yeah. So let me ask you this before we go, uh, what has been the most rewarding thing about the game of football for you? And it doesn't necessarily have to be the Super Bowl or, a big catch, but what did you get out of football more than anything else? Man, the friendships, you know, with all my teammates now, like when we come get together, it's like a big comedy show. Uh, what it's afforded me to do to go out and speak to children, um, you know, potential collegiate athletes, high school. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I had no idea that, you know, the six years would equate to, doing 40, almost 30 something years of um, community service. And it's something that I never shied away from. I always made a deal with God. I said, man, if I ever make it, I want to be like uh, Walter Payton and be man of the year. And um, was it that United Way? I always wanted to do a Un United Way commercial. Never got to do that, but I did get nominated for New York Giants uh, man of the year, which was uh, uh, such a great honor. And that means the most to me because you know it's all about making somebody else life happy and show them that there is a way you know that you can make your life rewarding and giving back that's my message to always give back man and i'm able to do that you know just mention the name of the super bowl when whitney houston sang in it oh yeah oh, i remember yeah. that and then they go like oh yeah and i Stephen baker oh the touchdown maker and it, the fan base here in new york they are just unbelievable because I'm originally from Los Angeles. I don't go home because of the fan base here and what the New York Giants do for us. Once a giant, always a giant. And I'm not just wearing this because I'm on the show here. If you go to my Facebook page, I'm wearing giant stuff every day. I, it's a part of my life. I, I, I always wanted to be an NFL player, and now I can be an NFL. I was an NFL player, and now I can be an ambassador for the team I played for. And my one slogan is, how cool is it to play uh, – be a fan of the team that you played for. Right. No doubt about <laughs> it. Well, Stephen, this was an honor for me. It really was. Uh, I really applaud you for the great football career you had. I can remember eighth grade at the bus stop, guys talking about you. And I was, no I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Miami Dolphins fan, but I could appreciate the oh. type of player you were and just watching. And, you know, I lived in Connecticut, so mm -hmm. I saw you all the time and what you gave to the game. And you are a great example of someone that, you never give up because you didn't give up. You followed your dream and you made it happen. And I think it's a great message to send to kids today that don't dream it, be it, because you can make it happen. And I really do congratulate you on a great career and what you have done outside of football as well. Like you said, being an ambassador for the Giants, speaking at these camps, stuff like that. To me, 
that is so remarkable. And I really do applaud you. And thank you for coming on today. It was a real pleasure. Oh, thank you very much, Mike. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, brother. Well, thank you. Well, there you have it, folks. Look at that number right there, number 85, and look <laughs> at the man that wore it. He had a dream from the time he was a 12-year-old boy, and he wanted that dream to come true. Sure, there were people who said, Stephen, you got to try something else. You're living in a dream world. Well, that's the thing, though, folks. You may not always fulfill your dreams, but you never stop dreaming. Stephen, the touchdown maker Baker, never stopped dreaming. And look what he did in his career. He caught a big touchdown pass in the Super Bowl. He was a part of a Super Bowl championship team that was won for the ages. And the stuff that he's doing in his life is a result of him never giving up, always believing that he could follow every dream that he sets out to do. For In the Spotlight, I'm Mike Kenichi. That was Steven Touchdown Maker Baker saying good night, everyone. Peace. All right.